Hi, I'm uh, Saranga. Um, I'm a general partner here at Balderton. I've been at the firm for about five years and I invest in technology companies all across Europe. Hi everyone, my name is Charlene Chen and I am currently the Chief Operating Officer of Lantum. So I'm Richard Robinson. I'm the CEO and founder of Robin AI. We are a machine learning legal tech company and we use artificial intelligence to read and edit legal contracts. So I trained as a computer scientist, I have a software background, um, and after doing lots of different engineering roles, I ended up at a company called Autonomy, which was a UK Cambridge-based company. Uh, but they moved me to the US to be their US CTO, uh, Chief Technology Officer. And out there, I was in charge of a team that grew from about 10 people to about 500 people in the time that I was there for, for about two years. So a really rapidly growing uh, business and company, um, and I got lots of exposure into, into how to build really large technology teams as part of that. So I'd spent years being an engineer and uh, most recently a CTO when I finally decided that I wanted to start my own company. And uh, while I was at Autonomy, where I was the CTO, I had the opportunity to um, work with a few friends on a side project. We had a scheme there where you could do that. Um, and one of those ideas ultimately turned into a company called Blinks, uh, which I ultimately left Autonomy to, to found. Um, I was the CEO of Blinks for about 10 years. Um, we managed to get the company profitable. We took the company public. Um, so we went through a pretty exciting journey all in all. Um, obviously lots of downs as well in between those ups, um, but ultimately built an enduring business and an enduring team and product. So I started my career as a consultant at Deloitte Consulting um, and then through a massive career shift ended up working in Sub-Saharan Africa during my MBA program, uh, which ended in 2009. Um, so while I was working in East Africa, after a number of years of working in the nonprofit sector, my good friend Elizabeth Rossiello said, hey, Charlene, I just had a, an angel investor give me $50,000 to start Africa's first Bitcoin company. And this was back in 2013. So I turned to her and I said, what the heck's Bitcoin? Um, and I started researching it. And at first I wasn't sure you know, if I was really feeling prepared to uh, start a company. I'd never been a COO before. I didn't feel like I had a particular expertise in finance, but I thought, what an adventure this would be. Um, so I said, I'll help you for six months. And that six months ended up turning into six years, uh, during which we scaled the business to, now it's over 130 people working across um, Nigeria, Kenya, uh, Senegal, the UK, across Europe, and other countries across Sub-Saharan Africa. So my founder stories, I was a lawyer for six and a half years. I worked at Clifford Chance and then at a law firm called Boy Schiller Flexner for altogether six and a half years. And I found out I was having a son and I thought now is the chance to finally do that, finally start that business I thought about starting as a teenager but i had no idea what i would do and i was sent on secondment to one of the big banks that was a client of one of my law firms and i started to notice when i was there that there was work that lawyers were doing that was complicated really complicated that required years of training to know how to handle but there was work that wasn't so complicated things that were business as usual processes, things that happened every day in different parts of the business that required lawyers to be involved, but actually weren't requiring the best legal minds. And so I wondered, is there a way we can use technology to automate the low complexity work lawyers do so that they can focus and thrive on the high complexity work that they've trained to do? And so it was really that insight that got me started down the road that is now the business and so we interviewed a lot of lawyers before I got started and I thought about the different types of tasks that lawyers do and where we ultimately ended up is well what we do today which is when someone asks a lawyer can I sign this contract something that happens every day lawyers always say don't sign a document unless you've read it well we develop technologies that mean you shouldn't need to read it <laughs> we read it for you and we use computers to look at a contract, understand it, edit it, and hopefully present it to you in a form that means it's it's acceptable. And right now we do that for business. We do it for a limited set of contracts because we're 
young and just getting started. But over time, we hope to be able to do that for everyone. The role of founder uh, is a really important one in any business. There's two parts to your job as a founder. The first part is your functional area of focus. If you are the CTO or chief technology officer, then your job is to own the technology in that company. Um, and that's a sort of fairly obvious thing. And I think most founders understand that as a CTO, they're in charge of technology, or as a COO, they're in charge of operations, or as a CMO, they're in charge of, of marketing. Um, the other part of being a founder, though, is the actual founder bit, which for me is primarily about the culture and the sentiment of the company you're building. Because really, you're the people who decided to give everything up and to start this new thing. Um, part of that new thing is operational. It's what you pro produce, it's what you market, it's how you sell it, who you sell it to. Um, but it's also sort of how you do it. Um, and the temperature of how you do it, the culture of how you do it, the values around which you do the thing you're doing. Those are things that presumably you as a group have and that you share to some extent. There'll be tensions, not everyone will agree, but it's that unique combinations of the why you're doing it and how you're doing it that I think founders become really important guardians of over time. Um, even later on in a company when you may no longer be the CTO because you may have actually hired someone who is, in your opinion, better than you at the technology, you will still be a founder. And so that piece about the culture, about the how and the why, never goes away. Yeah, being a CEO is a really interesting job. It's a very uh, lonely role. Um, on the one hand, I think people focus a lot on the sort of positives and the fact that you, know, you can get well known and that obviously it's a very well paid position and everything else, but there are also loads of challenges attached to it. When it happens well, it's beautiful and there's something really special about the job. Um, that is, I think, incomparable to really anything else. This feeling that you're sitting on top of a whole bunch of people all working in the same direction, all achieving something together. Unfortunately, alongside those amazing days, there are equally dark days where it feels like everybody is pulling you in different directions. Um, and that, that is a, a really painful thing to work through because the reality is people want different things. They're contrasting things. And so part of your job is to have to sort of balance between those. But the loneliness of the job means that there's really no one else to share that with. You can't go and talk to your favorite investor about it because he or she is a bit conflicted. You can't go and talk to your you know, uh, first employee about it because he or she is a bit conflicted. And so what you end up having to do is create, I think, some kind of support structure around you, um, some of which are people in the company or related to the company, some of which have nothing to do with the company, which is your sort of sounding board to really talk about these problems and share these problems. None of them will have an answer for you. You've got to find the answer, which again is one of the hard things about the job, but at least if you have people to share it with, I found that you can always work through the problems in the end. If you're in a group of founders who've decided to start a company together, sometimes one of the earliest questions is who's going to be CEO. Um, I actually think that you shouldn't obsess over this question. Um, I think that good CEOs emerge over time rather than are anointed at some point. And so what I would say is, you know, have a conversation. But I also think don't obsess over it. Um, over time, the person who is the natural CEO might turn out to be somebody else, and that's okay. We've had a number of companies here at Balderton where the CEO has changed between the founding group. And so one of the other things that we often do is say, you know, be smart about the way you treat things like ownership. Don't say, oh, whoever is the CEO automatically gets X percent more ownership in the company. If you're all genuinely equal founders, you can have equal ownership of the company because over time, if the CEO role changes, you don't have to wind back something because someone else had been anointed CEO earlier. So I, I really think that people get very obsessed about this and I've met companies who've wasted months um, not really starting their company because they're arguing about who should be CEO. For me, that's a really, really bad sign. If you've got a team that starts there and they're more worried about who's got which title, then the chance of them actually being able to build a business quickly seems pretty low. I think it's very difficult to define what a good chief operating officer is. And I think it can be really difficult for founders or companies to uh, identify um, who would make a great COO. I think the best way to describe um, a good COO and, and um, why I think, uh, why I may guess that I was selected for the role at Lantum um, is it's very much a, a role 
of, of Jill, Jack or Jill of all trades. Um, it's, it's a role that uh, requires someone who has a multitude of skill sets, someone who's more of a generalist rather than a specialist. So I think what's really essential to being a great COO is being able to wear any hat that needs to be worn or isn't being worn by someone else. So you need to both be highly strategic um, and being able to think about long-term strategy, um, but you also have to be really tactical. So you have to get roll up your sleeves and get into the weeds of whatever needs to be done. And then there's everything in the middle. So there's a big piece of being a great COO which is around people operations and being um, a fellow inspiration to the other people managers in the business and, and basically being the glue that helps keep the exec team together, but also the wider company. There are lots of differences between the job of being a founder and being a founder CEO or CEO. Um, and it depends a lot on the nature of your particular company. Um, but just to give you some examples, um, many of the companies that we work with um, have a founder uh, or founders to start with, and then at some point in time, they decide to hire in a CEO. Those roles can be quite different. I think at that point, the reason the company chooses to hire a CEO is because they've decided that the day-to-day -day operational job of being a CEO is one that the original founder or founders either no longer wants to do or no longer can do. Maybe it's because the team is really large. Uh, maybe it's because the product has moved into an area where they need new expertise. Um, and it makes sense to bring in someone different. And so the CEO's job then is very much to be in charge of the day-to-day. -day. Whereas the founder's job at that point, I would argue, is more about ensuring the overall longevity of the company. Thinking about the strategy, not just this year, but in five or 10 years time. There are lots of different ways to think about leadership. Um, but I think it's actually really important, most, the most important thing is to actually think about leadership. A lot of people who are leaders uh, get thrust into the situation. That was certainly the case for me when I was a CEO. Me and my, um, a close colleague of mine wanted to start a company. We started with an idea and a product and a technology. And it was really only afterwards that we realized that one of us had to be the CEO and had to be the leader. And it was pretty random that, you know, it was me that did it and, and not him. And so I think as a leader, you've got to do three things. Because it is a very practical skill, you have to approach it through learning and experiencing. So you have to put yourself into that leadership position. You have to try different things. You have to meet other leaders and, you know, beg, borrow and steal from the ways that they, that they are effective leaders. But you also should invest time every week, every month, every year in actually becoming a better leader. Um, and that's really about creating a little bit of time for yourself to be able to sit back, step away from the business or the organization that you're building and think more about you and the way you lead. Uh, and then after reflecting on that, pick out areas where you feel you're not leading very well. And when you figure that out, it's usually actually a fairly straightforward thing to figure out how you can talk to different places and different areas and different services to learn about that particular skill set better. If I, if I pick my um, top three mistakes uh, that, that I think founders make, the, the first is not realizing that the job changes. Um, so what you are as a founder when you're a seed stage company raising your first bit of money and still really turning an idea into a product is totally different to what you have to do as a CEO of a Series A company when you've already got product out, when you're selling it or, you, or people are using it and now you need to go and raise a different level of financing and you need to really build a large executive team. And I think a lot of founders, you know, excel at one stage of the company and try to keep doing what worked for them before. And what they need to realize is that while they haven't changed and the core thesis of what they're doing may not have changed, their company has changed and it's developed. And so as a result, the way they work has to change as well. A second classic um, mistake that I see founders make is around understanding the fact that the relationships they have with their co-founders and their teams will change over time. Um, the reality is a lot of startups are started with three or four founders. But if you fast forward five or six years later, most of, those, most of the successful companies will only have one or two of those founders still actively involved at the very top part of that team. And that's because things change. Um, you know, people's personal situations change. Some people who wanted to be a founder realized they can't for some reason or other. 
And sometimes it's because the company's changed and the nature of the challenge the company's facing now is not one that suits someone who was really well suited a few years ago. You need to realize that you need to be able to have an open conversation with people and say to people, look, I'm not sure that you're enjoying this job or doing as well at this job as you used to. And do you agree? And if you do, let's figure out what we do with that, um, rather than pretending that everything's okay and tapering over. Mm -hmm.